Hi guys, welcome back for episode number 79 of the weekly playback. Um, gosh, there's always fur flying around. Um, that's something that cannot be helped. Toffee is extremely floofy, so when you have a very floofy cat, their fur just is everywhere, and I often see it just flying around in the videos, um, which I hope is not super distracting for you guys, but there's really nothing I can do about it. Like, he is very, very fluffy, like super duper fluffy, and he has the softest fur. Like, everyone who meets Toffee always says that he has the softest fur of any cat that that they have ever met and I swear to god it's so true like if you ever get the chance to meet Toffee I don't know how that'll happen but if it does uh, you will see for yourself that his fur is so incredibly soft um, I swear to god he must be like part alpaca or something I just I just cannot explain it I just do not know how it is so soft he eats the same food that I used to feed to Do Dobby but of course Dobby was a short hair uh, cat and Toffee is a long haired cat um, but yeah insanely soft Fur, like just yeah anyway um, I'll, I'll quit talking about toffee's fur but yeah so we're almost at episode 100 um so i think uh for episode 100 maybe i would like to do some kind of a big giveaway for like on youtube only though because these videos are on youtube so maybe i can like try to get some publishers to maybe sponsor a giveaway i think that would be really cool if i did a giveaway for my viewers of youtube like my weekly playback viewers i will look into that but yeah so we're almost there so anyway i have nothing else to say right now so i will just get into the games that i played this week so let's talk about Mythic Mischief Volume 2. So Volume 2 is coming out on Kickstarter, I believe in September, so next month. Um, it's actually not on BGG yet, so um, I'm just gonna read the information that is for Volume 1. Um, so it's designed by Max Anderson, Zach Dixon, and Austin Harrison, and it's published by IV Games. Um, so Volume 2 introduces some new factions, but not only does it introduce new factions, it introduces like a new playing area, but the playing area Area is essentially going to be the same as the library except now it's a hedge maze so in volume two you are going to have a hedge maze with hedges instead of bookcases so let me just show you all the components first so you are going to have a groundskeeper instead of a tome keeper so this is the groundskeeper he is super cool like this is like this reminds me a lot of like um kind of like alice in wonderland and um i don't know what else just you know things that you know have hedge mazes in them and you know when i think of hedges i all, always think of like you know uh england mostly so yes yeah, so you're going to have like these hedge pieces instead of bookcases um but essentially everything else is going to be the same you're going to basically have cards um so you're going to have instead of before lunch and after lunch it's going to be before dark and after dark so you know again you'll have cards where you know it tells you where you will place everything where where you're going to place the numbers one two and three where the hedge um the groundskeeper is trying to go where you're going to place your tomes so they are still tomes so that is still the same so um you know they didn't make the tomes thematic um but i think that's so that you can play it interchangeably with the library so they are still tomes so this hedge maze is on the grounds of the school in which mythic mischief took place so it's still the same kind of universe so you still have tomes so i will show you some of these uh, factions so this is the gargoyles faction so as you can see it still has tomes and you know some of them will have special components that go with only their faction so let me just show you an example of a gargoyle up close very cool um here's another one and you can see he's like kind of holding books and stuff so of course you know the different factions have their own special abilities so let me show you the gargoyles so i actually played as the gargoyles when i played this last night um i miss i think i misunderstood um some of the abilities like i misunderstood perch and it wasn't until like towards the end of the game that i realized i misunderstood it because my friend he kind of like was like no like you can move them together this way like i'm not even going to explain what i thought you could do because now that i look at it i, I realize how stupid it was but yes uh, so i misunderstood the ability so i was like gosh these gargoyles suck i'm gonna play as the fairies next time because my opponent was playing as the fairies and i really like the fairies abilities but now that i understand the abilities a little bit better maybe i'll play it again because um this ability uh stone is pretty cool it reminds me of that one doctor who episode so you can uh use that one uh piece i showed you 
and that's your um, legendary kind of ability. So you can put it underneath one of your gargoyles, which will uh, make you stone. So that means that nothing can move or pass through that gargoyle until their next turn, which is really a good ability. So the stone ability is really cool, um, but I need to play this again and play correctly with the perch ability. <laughs> so that is the gargoyles. Um, the fairies, oh, I love the fairies. I love the colors of the factions in this game. Like the colors I am absolutely obsessed with. I'm absolutely obsessed with the box. Like the box is freaking gorgeous. Um, like if they ever introduce, because I have Mythic Mischief behind me, like the, uh, you know, the big addition with all of the factions, including the bonus factions from the last campaign, if they ever introduce like a bigger box where you can store everything, I hope they go with this color scheme because it's just so freaking beautiful. I just absolutely love it. Um, I hope I get to keep this. <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, so here are the fairies. So here is one fairy. Um, so I apologize because I know my camera is not great for zooming into these. So, but the fairies are really cool. And here's like a special component that goes with the fairies. Like it will just pop under one of these. So that is uh, the fairies. Um, and yeah, and they have their tomes and dice, of course. And let me show you the fairy board. So the board, the uh, antics um, special ability for fairies, I think is really powerful and I really like it. So that is the fairies board. Now let's show you the gnomes. Uh, I absolutely love this color. I think it is such a freaking beautiful color. It's like kind of like a sea green almost. It's just a really gorgeous color. Absolutely love it. So yeah, so these are the gnomes. And here is the board for the gnomes. Yeah, so really just such a beautiful color. I really love the color of these miniatures. I hope that they keep them and don't change them. And then finally we have the werewolves. Do, 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 do. would be pretty cool to play a game of werewolves uh, werewolves versus vampires from the original uh, Mythic Mischief. I think that would be pretty cool. So yeah, so I mean, it plays very similarly, basically the same as the original. So you all have your own special abilities. You're just trying to stay out of the way of the Tome Keeper while, or the Groundskeeper in this case, while getting your opponents in the way of the Tome Keeper or Groundskeeper. Um, and you're going to be able to move these hedges um, as you would the bookcases in the original edition, there will be clutter that you need to, you know, spend extra movement to go through. The groundskeeper is going to be trying to get to these numbered spots, which directs his movement. So, of course, once you take a turn, then the groundskeeper will move. And uh, before dark, it'll be four spaces. And then after dark, I think it's three spaces that he moves. And he's always going to take the shortest path available. But if there's multiple short paths, then the active player, the player who had just taken their turn, will get to decide. Um, and then will be the next player's turn and you're trying to get your opponent caught by the groundskeeper so that's how you earn points so the first player to 10 points will win and the point tracker is here but if someone does not get to 10 points before the game ends and after dark um, then whoever has the most points at that point in time would win so yeah it's a really great game i absolutely love it as i've described it before it feels it's like kind of like playing chess with magical abilities um, so you know if you enjoy games like chess like abstract games abstract movement games in which you have different abilities then you will definitely love mythic mischief it's the reason i keep it up there behind me because i actually really love chess i just really really suck at it and as you guys know i absolutely love magic and harry potter like i'm a huge harry potter fan so this kind of like immerses me in the world of like harry potter because you know it's got these different magical factions with different abilities and I can just kind of imagine myself in like a magical library or a magical hedge maze now. Um, yeah, I just really, really love it. Oh, it's such a good game. But so yeah, um, I highly recommend it. So, but of course I am being paid to do an overview video of this. So, you know, but I do really love this game, which is why I have it displayed behind me. But I've, I'm just absolutely in love with this box. I just really, really love this box. Like the colors are just so freaking beautiful. Oh my God. I think I want to paint my walls this color someday. Like this color here, it's such a beautiful color. In fact, my office in Ithaca is painted lavender. Um, I had the opportunity to, uh, my my like actual work office, like 
at my law firm. Um, it's actually painted purple. So a few years ago, I had the opportunity to paint my walls because we had just, you know, totally remodeled the office. And our manager said, yeah, if you want to go in and spend your own money to buy paint and paint it before we move your furniture back in, then sure. So I did. <laughs> so I painted my walls purple and I absolutely love it. Uh, it was a lot of hard work. I do not think I would ever paint walls by myself again. I had to go in on two separate occasions and uh, I, need to I needed to enlist the help of a friend and we had to get a ladder because some of the walls were really, some of the walls were really, really high and just out of reach because um, it has like a point, my office has a pointed ceiling and it has a beautiful view of the inlet, the Cayuga Lake Inlet. But anyway, I totally went off topic here. So yeah, I do have purple walls, just not in my house unfortunately so that was mythic mischief um, so let's move on to the next game another game i had the opportunity to play recently is Volanimo. so this is a 2020 game for two to five players designed by bruno catala and the art is done by dominique martins and this is published by 25th century games now this is a ladder climbing game um, and trick taking game as well so i've talked about this before um, yet again i only played a two player game of this so i've played this once before at two players and again i played it at two players so you know you're going to have like different cards with different animals on them and different numbers and stuff and it's a ladder climbing game so you know you're going to each player is going to start with 11 cards in their hand in a two-player game and you one player is going to put down a card and then or two cards or a combination of you know more cards you know it's up to them and then you are trying to beat that number your objective is to empty your hand like you win a round if you are able to empty your hand of cards um, so for example if i put down a one then my opponent has to beat the one if you put down cards that are of the same color or of the same number then each card actually counts as 10 points and then you add the lowest value of the card uh, on top of that. So this would be a total of 22. Whereas if I did this, this would be a total of 31 because 10, 20, 30, and then one. So 31 points. Um, these special cards you can only play by themselves. You cannot add them to a set of cards. So because they're already very high numbered. So your objective is to try to get rid of all of your cards. There are cards that will allow you to do special things. So for example, if you do play a one, you have to steal a card from your opponent and give them a card for each turtle that you have played. Um, the card you give back to them could be the card you just stole. If you play a camel, you have to draw a card from the draw deck. Um, in a two-player game, the way it works is if your opponent cannot play a card, like let's suppose we're playing and then I cannot place any combination of cards that would surpass what is on the table, you're going to clear the table, there's going to be one card face up, and then um, the winner would get to decide who gets that card. So my opponent, since I couldn't play a card, he would get to decide who gets the face-up card and who starts the next round, um, the next turn, um, because that round hasn't finished yet, because the round ends once someone is out of their cards. And then for scoring, um, in a two-player game, it's the first player to reach eight or more points, I believe. Um, I could be wrong, but I believe it's eight or more points, yes. Um, so, for example, if uh, the person who wins round one is going to get one point, the person who wins round two is going to get two points, the person who wins round three is going to get three points, and so on. You get the point. So the game can end before the end of round five in a two-player game. Um, but in my instance, we did end up playing the total of five rounds, and in the end, I won with 11 points, and my opponent won with uh, lost with four points. But yeah, it's a really fun ladder climbing game. Um, you know, it can be a little bit long because of the multiple multiple rounds you're playing, um, but it's fun. I like it. Um, you know, of course there's luck involved with the cards you're dealt, but there's also strategy, like trying to kind of just imagine what your opponent might have, just trying to know when is the right time to um, play a certain hand of cards, because, you know, you probably don't want to play, you know, cards that are really high, going to be high value together all at once in the beginning, um, because you kind of want to work your way up to a higher number. Um, otherwise, it's going to be really hard to eliminate all of your cards. But it's a really fun game. And if you like ladder climbing games like Scout and you like trick taking games, then I do recommend Volanimo. I would like to play this at a higher player count. I have not had the opportunity to do that yet. So maybe one day I'll take it to my game night and try to play it at a higher player count then, um, because I would like to see how it works at a higher player count. 
there is a jersey um, which gives you I believe a special ability when you play a multiplayer game like uh, three or more but we in a two-player game you do not use the jersey so I have not had the opportunity to use the jersey so yeah so that is Villanimo so check it out if you like trick-taking games and ladder climbing games so I'm going to be talking about a number of games which I do not have in my possession so I cannot show you. The first of those is going to be Nanty Narking. So Nanty Narking, let's just bring up the information, is a 2019 game, 2019 game for two to four players designed by Martin Wallace. And the artwork is done by a bunch of artists whose names I cannot pronounce. They look kind of like Polish or Eastern European. Um, but I really like the artwork, but I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce those names. And it's published by Phalanx Games. Um, so this is a kind of like a bluffing game with, um, uh, you're kind of like, with you have hidden roles. So you're going to have, this, this takes place in Victorian England. So you're going to have a map of Victorian London and there's different like, you know, sections of the map. So different areas of London, like for example, um, Holborn, which is where I actually used to work when I lived in London, um, Bermondsey, uh, Mayfair, you know, so you have the different sections of London and they're like, you know, separated by color, but in some areas of the board, the color distinction is not strong enough, I think. So I'm not colorblind, but I, I don't know, you know, how colorblindness affects different people, but the colors there, like I cannot, you know, I imagine that it might be difficult for some players to distinguish those colors in one part of the board. Like I think that they should have, you know, chosen some kinds of other colors as well. But anyway, um, so you are going to have a set of miniatures, which in this deluxe edition are just amazing. The miniatures are so really just really really nice um so you have miniatures for people and then miniatures for buildings so you are going to be trying to place miniatures in different areas and buildings and try to gain control of different areas well you may not necessarily even want to gain control it depends on what your own win condition is so everyone has a secret identity which tells you what your win condition is so my win condition was to have eight disrupt disruption i think tokens they were called around the board and the way disruption tokens work is if you place a person into an area where uh, people are already there then you just add a disruption token um or I think that's what they were called. Um, but other people have different win conditions, like they need to be in control of like say four adjacent areas or you know things like that. So on your turn, you're just going to have a hand of cards and these cards can be completely random and they have icons in the corner and the, on the left hand side and you have to follow the icons in order from top to bottom and you know perform the actions. So some of them may allow you to place someone somewhere, some of them may allow you to take money from your opponents um, because in order to place buildings, you have to spend money and the buildings in different areas cost a different amount of money. Um, some of them may allow you to steal cards from opponents. Some of them may allow you to build a building. Some of them may allow you to look at some secret identity cards that have not been used and so on. Um, so it's completely random. So the cards, you know, are just basically based on luck, what you get. Um, so, you know, there's a huge element of luck in this game. Um, it's going to be one of those games where I feel like people are just going to keep on undoing what you're doing. So, so like I just found it really, I was like, it's going to be impossible for me to win. Like the other players kept on removing these disruption tokens, which I needed. Um, and I was like, I need eight of them to win this game. It's just not going to happen. They just kept on getting removed. I was like, this game is hopeless for me, but I was still really enjoying it because I just really love Victorian London and I'm just a sucker for anything to do with Victorian London. So yeah, I was really tempted to even buy the game, but in the end I was like, no, I should not. So I didn't, I didn't buy it in the end. Um, but yeah, so, you know, it's a fun game. Um, you know, if you really don't like games with luck in it, um, then you might not want to play this game because you might get frustrated at the cards that you pick up and you might get frustrated if you're not getting the actions you need in order to meet your win condition. So there is like that huge element of luck in this game. Um, but you know, if you enjoy bluffing games, if you enjoy games in which you have hidden identities, if you enjoy Victorian London, then you might enjoy this game. Um, you know, if I ever see it on sale for like say 20 bucks or something, then I'll probably get it. Um, yeah, but um, I'm not gonna spend like 80 or whatever dollars that, that this game costs. I had the opportunity to get it at a lower price yesterday, but even at the lower price, I was like, no, it's, you know, I, I just 
can't justify spending that much on this game when I have too many other games and I do have games that take place in Victorian London so I, I decided not to get it um, but I'm glad I had the opportunity to play it because this was a game that I had on my list of games that I want to play for a very long time like I've had my eyes on this game for ages so I'm really glad that Millennium Games had it as their learn and play game last night so so yeah I really enjoyed my play of it but um, not a game that I'm personally going to add to my collection anytime soon unless I get it for super duper cheap some Day. So yeah, so that is Nanti Narking. So moving on. So let's talk about another game I had the opportunity to play, which I do not own, and that is Catherine's Cities of the Tsarina. I am surprised that this game did not really get as much attention as I thought it would, considering that it's published by Capstone Games. So Catherine Cities of the Tsarina came out in 2022. It's designed by Johannes Schmidor Koenig and the art is done by Klaus Stefan and Anche Stefan and again it's published by DLP Games and Capstone Games. I feel like Capstone Games you know is like a really reputable publisher with like games that you know when they come out they get a lot of attention like Arc Nova which I really do not like <laughs> so but I love a lot of other Capstone games but Arc Nova I just absolutely hate that game. So I just could not understand why this game just did not seem to get the attention it deserved but then my my friend last night mentioned that you know it was released at the same time that Russia started um, invading Ukraine and I guess the game kind of got cancelled for that reason which is such a shame because I actually really enjoyed my play of it. So, um, so in this game you are going to have a board which shows a map of Russia and you are going to have a tracker on the side which is like a, I don't remember if it's called fame or something like that we'll just call it the crown tracker. So you're going to have a crown tracker on the side and you're going to be dealt some cards and to begin the game you are going to put out three cards. These cards are going to be different colors and at the top of the card you'll see certain symbols and then at the bottom you'll see actions. So in order to take an action what you're going to do each turn is you're first going to draw two cards your hand limit will be determined by where you are on the crown tracker so everyone I believe starts the game with a hand limit of four I think but I, I could be wrong so you can increase that hand limit as the game progresses um, your hand limit if at some point when you're actually taking your action you have to add cards to your hand you cannot exceed your hand limit so every card you have to forego because you're at your hand limit you'll gain a point instead um, but the hand limit you can exceed when you're actually drawing cards um, at the beginning of the next turn so that at that point you're allowed to exceed your hand limit and the reason is because cards that you have left over at the end of the game will also be worth points uh, one point each so you're going to place out three cards uh, before the game begins and then from the cards in your hand in order to activate a card's action you need to place a matching color card matching colored card underneath that card so like let's suppose there's a blue card i want to activate um, the action on that blue card i need to place a blue card underneath it from my hand you're going to place the cards face down and additionally you're going to place a face down card next to the top row of cards and then that's going to be revealed and that will be a card that you can also place another card underneath in order to activate you could even do it in that same turn so for example the card that you're placing face down in the top row you can also place the card that you want to you know the new card that you're activating that the card you can place underneath in the bottom row can be underneath the card that you just placed in the top row so you'll flip both of those over so when you flip over your cards you're going to the card that you just flipped over in the bottom row is going to activate the card above it and you'll do the action on the bottom um different kinds of actions like it may allow you to place a residence somewhere which you'll get these tokens and these tokens will kind of give you set collection points like each person starts with the card at the beginning of the game that tells you which kinds of tokens you need in order to some you know gain some extra points at the end of the game um, you may want to um, I don't know you may want to go up the crown tracker so certain actions will allow you to do that um, certain actions may allow you to get more cards and so on um, so again going up the crown tracker allows you to increase your hand limit it also will give you points um, there's like mid there's scoring at the end of like each round so you'll get points that way as well um, so yeah it's kind of like a it's a fun game so you're you know there's the icons at the top you know you need different icons in order to activate certain abilities certain actions and then uh, after the after you've played your sixth or maybe it's seventh card 
seventh action or no after you have seven cards in the top row so you haven't necessarily done seven actions because you always have the cards to begin with um, but after there are seven cards in the top row um, then the round will end and you're going to do mid-round scoring and that's when you will look at the crown tracker you'll get points from that you'll also uh, some of the symbols on the cards are cannons whoever has the most cannons so you're going to look at your neighbors if you have more cannons than your neighbor you'll get four points um, if there's a tie then I believe it's like two points uh, you'll look at the books icons if you have more book icons than the other players you'll get to place a res residence out on the map and so on so yeah so that is essentially the game um so it's like a hand management game, but there, again, there's also network and route building because you're trying to connect different cities as well um, and simultaneous action selection. Yeah, um, I think it's a good game. It's a solid game, I would say. I think it just, you know, kind of went under the radar because of, you know, what was happening because I just couldn't understand why this game just was not getting as much attention as I thought a Capstone Games game would. Um, but I think it's a good game. Unfortunately, the rating on BGG is 6.4. I would rate it more like a 7. I'm not sure why it's just a 6.4, but I think it's a solid game and if you're able to get it at like a discounted price like I know our game store Millennium Games had it in the sale section um, for a while so if you're able to get it at a discounted price I think it's a pretty good game so yeah so I enjoyed my play of Catherine the uh, Cities of the Tsarina so moving on another game I got to play which I do not own is Clank Catacombs so this was my first ever play of a Clank game in fact which I know is crazy so Clank Catacombs came out in 2022. It's designed by Paul Dunnan. Um, the art is done by Clay Brooks, Anika Burrell, Nate Storm, and Dan Taylor, and it's published by Direwolf and I believe Renegade Games. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I thought it was Renegade, but I could be wrong. I don't know, just Direwolf. Okay, hmm, my bad. I don't know why I thought Renegade. Strange. Um, so Clank Catacombs, um, Sorry, I don't think I mentioned the player accounts for two to four players. This is a deck uh, building um, game in which you are basically unveiling tiles and you're like moving on to these different tiles that you're unveiling. There's like different like sections that you can go to like different rooms. Um, and you're trying to collect different things. You're trying to build up your deck. You're trying to like add like um, swords to your deck so you can fight monsters and gain rewards and also move around the map that you're unveiling as well because certain um, paths you need to have swords in order to cross over them otherwise you'll take damage so the way the game end triggers is uh someone you know if they end up getting too much damage because there's a certain point in the game where you start pulling out these tokens so if you um at the bottom of your card you're going to have uh some of the cards are going to say clank and like any deck building game you want to try to trash those cards you want to try and trash cards that have clank on them and there will be uh times available for you or you know different cards will allow you the ability to trash certain cards so you want to try to do that so certain cards will have clank on them and every time you have a clank if you cannot like mitigate that clank with another card then you're going to have to add one of your cubes to this one section of the board and then um, when a dragon appears or something then those cubes get added to a bag and then you start pulling out cubes and uh yeah and that gets added to your damage tracker and if you reach the end of your damage tracker you will die and if you die in the black section of a board like a black tile you do not get to add up your points at the end of the game if you die in a purple section you still get to add up all your points and you're still in the running to try to win the game so the game end i believe triggers once like all the players have died except for one and then that person will maybe have like an opportunity to try to hopefully end back you know go back to the purple section so if they die because you know they're probably going to die then um you know at least they'll get to add up their points so in the game i played um it was a two-player game so the other player he died and then i made my way back to the purple and then i died and then i won but i won by a pretty good margin like um i, I had a really good game <laughs> so it's my first time ever playing clank and i was just like rolling in the money i had like multiple treasures i had like um 
a few different like of those tokens from the special area that you can get. Like I had a really good game of Clank um, and I really enjoyed it. So yeah, so you're just like exploring this map, just trying to collect different things, just trying to build up your deck while you're fighting monsters, trying to collect different treasures, trying to get money and like symbols so that you can get better and better cards and trash your crappy cards and so on. So yeah, it's a deck building game, but with like a map ex exploration element to it, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I'd never played Clank before. I actually have two Clanks in my collection. So I have just the regular Clank and then I have Clank in outer space and both of them were on my are on my shelf of shame. Um, so I will need to get those out and play them. But I'm really glad that I got to play Clank. Um, it's a pretty fun game. So yeah, I was really happy to play that. So moving on. Another game I played recently, which I do not own, is Dinosaur Island Roar and Write. Um, so this is a uh, flip and write, no, sorry, roll and write game, not flip and write, um, from 2021, designed by Brian Lewis, David McGregor, Marissa Musura, and the art is done by Quan Chai Moria and Andrew Thompson, and it's for one to four players, and it's published by Pandasaurus Games. So this is an interesting uh, flip and write. Why do I keep on calling it flip and write? Roll and write game. So this is an interesting roll and write game. So in this game, you are going to have like a sheet of paper in front of you with like a grid and you're trying to like basically create dinosaur attractions. Um, so you're going to be, uh, you know, you'll have two sheets of paper in fact. So on one sheet of paper, you'll see like, um, you know, different trackers. So you'll have like the different kinds of DNA that you're trying to get. You'll have um, different combinations at the bottom that show you which DNA combinations you need in order to make certain dinosaurs. You'll have like a danger tracker, um, you know, because there's obviously danger. And if you don't mitigate the danger, you're going to lose people in the game um, and so on. And you, that's where, you know, you're going to have your like a uh, big grid where you're going to be drawing the attractions and the attractions that you are drawing the different kinds of dinosaurs or like, for example, food and whatever, they have their own specific shapes. And then there's also exits um, in the park that you are trying to reach because you're going to have a run through. So you're going to have um, this part where you actually like do um, a run through where you get to go through the park and like try to visit the different attractions and you try to gain excitement that way because excitement is going to give you points and rewards and so on so yeah so you're basically rolling these dice and then taking turns drafting them it's like a snake drafting system and then you're going to be placing those first you're going to take the things that you get from those dice and mark them onto your own sheets and then you are going to have the opportunity to place them onto this one board to do other actions with those dice. Um, so those actions may be to get more roads because you need to make roads on your map in order to get from one attraction to another. They could be to mitigate some uh, danger. It could be to create another dinosaur attraction um, uh, or sorry, to create dinosaur attractions. So you actually need to select that on the board in order to draw those dinosaur attractions on your map. Um, it could be to uh, uh, just uh, double the value of what's on that die and so on. So if, you know, multiple people can go on the same action spot with their die, however, each die, um, some of the uh, faces have these little pips on them. And if someone else wants to go on an action that you already used with your own die, if there's those little tiny orange pips on them, then they are going to have to add danger to their own sheet if they want to take the same action by placing their die on top of yours. But not all faces have that. So you can kind of influence what other people might do by um, placing a die on a location that has like say three danger pips on it. So that might, you know, um, cause the other player to not want to use the same action that you used. Um, there are different kinds of um, um, workers that you may want to uh, get and whose, act whose abilities you may want to activate. So, you know, you are trying to earn money as well so that you can employ these workers. Um, and use their abilities um, and you know they'll all give you an immediate ability once you earn them and then there's an ongoing ability like dur during certain phases of the game that you'll get to use. Um, what else is there? Um, 
I mean, that's the gist of the game. So, you know, you're going to go through the different phases of the game. You roll the dice, you collect what you have, then you place them onto the board to do the actions. And then once everyone has done that, that's when you like activate the park and you run through it. And you're going to like go through the park and see if you uh, can actually go from the entrance to each attraction. And the first time you visit an attraction, you're going to mark it with an X because that will allow you to check off some excitement on your excitement tracker. So you're going to do a run through of the park and then you will see uh, you'll go to the excitement section of your board uh, of your sheet and then you'll get to collect certain bonuses that you've received there and then there's the danger part if you were not able to mitigate some danger you might lose some people there's going to be deaths and that will cause you you know if you get a certain number of deaths that's going to be bad for you you're going to have to like cross off something from your board and so on so this game is played over three rounds and with, I believe, three turns in each round. Um, it goes by pretty quickly. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a good game, though. Um, I liked it. You know, there's a lot of options for you to kind of choose in this game. So, you know, it was my first time ever playing it. So just trying to go and figure out, you know, just trying to pick the right strategy was a little bit, um, you know, hard because it was my first time playing. And I just feel like there was like a lot of options in this game. Um, but I think I did pretty well for my first game. In fact, I did not have any deaths in my park. I was always able to mitigate my damage, which was really good. Um, so I can just tell you what the scores were in case anyone's interested, um, because I do believe I recorded the scores. Um, the end game scoring, you will like be able to score for like the different people you had, like the dinosaurs, the different kinds of um, dinosaur attractions you had, and so on. Um, and you know you'll uh, get points for your excitement level and all of that. Um, so let's look at scores. Where would? Uh, yeah, here we go. So I only played it for one time and my score was 70 and my opponent scored 87 and he's played a number of times. So yeah, I'm a, you know, there's like a lot of options to choose from, but you know, I, I feel like the more you play, the more you'll figure it out. And there's like a very specific way in which you want to place your attractions so that you can um, end up like trying to activate all of them, but also reach these different exits, which will get you points as well. Um, and you can't like place attractions adjacent to each other. And then roads only take up one tiny square. So you have to make sure that you get enough roads to connect the attractions as well. So there is quite a bit of a uh, bit going on in this game. So if you enjoy roll and rights with, you know, a lot of options and different, you know, strategies that you might be able to pursue, then I think that this is a roll and write that you would enjoy, especially if you enjoy the dinosaur theme. I do love roll and rights but I do not feel inclined to add this to my collection because I have so many already and honestly I'm not a huge dinosaur uh, fan so I mean I love learning about dinosaurs but in terms of games like I'm not really that into dinosaurs and dinosaur games so um, I do not feel particularly inclined to add this to my collection but I would be happy to play it again so that was Dinosaur Island Roar and Write Okay, let's talk about games that I am backing. I actually am backing something. So I know I probably should not be backing anything, but I just could not resist this game. Um, so I'm backing Mistwind. So it's navigate through the Mistwind Islands while building outposts, connecting networks, and delivering cargo with flying transport whales. Um, so yeah, so it looks really cool. It's designed by Adrian Adamskew and Daryl Andrews. So they are the designers of Sagrada and one of my favorite games, Speakeasy Blues. I absolutely love Speakeasy Blues. So this team together again for a game, which is supposed to be like one of their best games that they've designed together from all the reviews that I've seen of this game. And I absolutely love the look of it. Um, and they actually have this thing now where you can submit, um, names for a contest for the different boards that they're going to have. Originally, I don't know how that's working because originally they had pledge levels where if you backed at that one pledge level, you could name the boards. Um, it says get your name on one of the five player boards, but now they have a naming contest. And um, so, um, you know, and the become a captain, it looks like they actually uh, sold out on that pledge level. So I wonder if they're still doing that, plus having a naming contest for the remaining boards. I really don't know how this is working, but I was like, I would not want a game that just has like, you know, kind of like plain names on them. I mean, no offense, but like, you know, if your name is like John or something, I don't want a board that just has the name John on it. Like, or even my own name, like Sarah, like I don't want a board that just has the name Sarah on it. Like I want like cool and quirky names that kind of fit the universe. You know what I mean? So I don't want just like average Joe names on these player boards. So the people who pledged at that level, I'm wondering like what their names are and what names we're 
going to get stuck with on the boards because of their names <laughs> but so i'm happy that they have like this contest where you can kind of submit ideas so i have uh, submitted a couple names which i doubt that they'll choose um, so you can kind of uh, submit a name for like a location for like a cargo vessel or something like that and so on um, so if you you know if you go to the campaign page you can click on the link to do that um, so yeah, so I'm backing this. It's a bit pricey. Um, I got the early bird special, so that comes out to around $82 plus shipping. Um, so yeah, it is, it's a pricey game, um, but hopefully it'll be worth it. I mean, the reviews seem good. So, and if not, hopefully it'll hold up its value so I could sell it if I end up not being a fan. But again, I do like their game, um, Speakeasy Blues. So hopefully I'll end up being a fan of this game. So that is the only game that I am backing right now, I think. Um, I think so, because I think that the pledge, the uh, campaign for uh, Wizards and Co. ended, I think. Um, yeah. So yeah, so that's all I'm backing. So let's go on to games that I have bought and or received. And there's quite a few to show this week. Like last week I had none to show, but now I have quite a few. So I already showed you guys Mythic Mischief Volume 2, which is a review copy because I'm going to be creating an overview video of that. Um, so uh, there's one more review copy I'll show. So I'll show the re review copy first and then I'll go on to the other stuff. So, um, I received an email from Tabletop Tycoon and Starling Games is coming out with this cooperative game called Exo World Survival. Um, so I said, yeah, I would be interested in playing this. Um, oh dear. Sorry about that if you heard that large ding. <laughs> so that's a text message. I should have put my phone on airplane mode. Um, so yeah, so this is a cooperative game that I received from... Starling Games, uh, their distributor, Tabletop Tycoon. It is for, uh, I don't see the information there. Um, so let's see if it's in here. Or I could just look it up on BGD. I shall just do that. Um, let's see. Ba -ba -ba -ba, ba -ba 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 -ba. Exo World Survival. It actually doesn't even have an image yet up on BGG. So this is designed by Juan Pablo and Vargas Siguel. Um, the art is done by Vlad Rysian and is published by Starling Games and Tabletop Tycoon. It's for one to five players. So it says, work with your fellow colonists to survive on the strange alien exoplanets. Um, so it comes with this one main board in which you're going to be keeping track of like different levels of things. And this is a dual layered board, so the things will fit in nicely. So that's nice. Um, so the tokens that will be fitting in there are these, um, these nice like little plasticky clear tokens. Um, then there are a bunch of like different other smaller kinds of tokens and then there are these player pawns and then there's different kinds of cards Now I haven't played this yet, so I can't even say what it might be similar to. Like I have absolutely no idea like what this would be even similar to. Like right now, um, for mechanisms, it says action points, automatic resource growth, cooperative game, map edition, scenario mission, campaign game, and so on. Um, so it comes with these uh, boards. I don't know what they are, but I guess maybe there's different like player abilities or scenarios. Um, so yeah, these must be scenarios because it has difficulty levels on them. And then it looks like there's some different sites. Um, so like here is like a planet with some information and then on the back it has like the difficulty level and different stuff. Um, like it has your production levels for setup and rules for setup and so on. So yeah, um, and then it looks, I guess that's what all of these are actually. Yeah, it looks like all of these are just planets with the different setups and stuff that you can do. So yeah. Um, so again, I don't know how it plays, but um, I received this, so hopefully I'll get a chance to play it soon. Um, so another game I received recently. So let's go on to... Um, actually, let me show this because this is kind of a review copy as well. So I had covered Life of the Amazonia for its Kickstarter, so I received my production copy. So. Um, firstly, I will say that this is a great game. I really enjoyed my play of it, but um, this wooden 
waterfall was so hard to put together and mine broke and cracked in multiple places so i cannot take this apart like originally i was like oh this is going to be great like i can take this apart and put it in the box and then take this to game nights and we can use the wooden waterfall absolutely not cannot take this apart because it will totally break and become just unusable like this part i had to kind of like stick it back in but this one chunk completely broke off and I've just kind of wedged it back in there. I need to super glue it and there's a huge crack here. There's multiple huge cracks on this thing. Um, it was just so hard to put together. Um, you can see it like here. It's also broken. Um, yeah, so if you have this and you have not yet put it together, you can see cracks here. Um, yeah, it's also cracked here. So yeah, um, it's a very difficult to put together it's, it's a you know i just feel it was not made well um so that's the wooden waterfall so i'm actually going to take out my cardboard waterfall but the problem is the cardboard components in this are not very good uh, the car the cardboard quality is just kind of poor in my opinion um so my uh edition you know it's the deluxe edition and it came with like you know um sleeves so i sleeved all the cards which i also think is great because um the, the card quality seemed not that great either so the cards are all sleeved which is good um interestingly enough um <laughs> you know i got a pledge with all the sleeves and it was one sleeve short for the small cards and i was like are you kidding me one sleeve short for the small cards i mean that's just crazy there's a whole bunch of cards here as well um here are like some of the map like um, you know, I mean, it's not terrible quality, but it's not the best. Um, but here are like the terrain tiles you're going to be adding. There are some boats, which I'm just going to leave assembled because um, I managed to fit everything in, but I'm going to leave these assembled because I don't, I think that, you know, assembling and taking them apart over and over again will just damage them. Um, so I have all the wooden resource components and everything. So like I have all these like wooden trees, which are really nice. I mean, the meeples and the trees and stuff are just really, really nice. Um, can't lie there. Um, so I'm actually going to show you the resource holders. So, yeah, so these are cardboard resource holders, token holders. Um, this I also think is going to be a bit fragile and probably will deteriorate with multiple uses. I think I would just like kind of leave it like this and have people just kind of reach in rather than taking it out completely because I can already see like just trying to put it back in. It's already... Um, it's already kind of like not good in some areas and I haven't even played this yet. So um, So yeah, so I think the quality maybe could have been a little bit better, but the game itself is very good um, So the game itself, it's a really great game I really enjoyed my play of it when I played it when I was covering it for its Kickstarter So I am looking forward to playing it again um, So yeah, I mean I have the deluxe edition so you know different resource tokens all in wood um, the meeples on um, these flower tokens they're pretty too um, some extra money player components but let me just show you the animals because the animals are like obviously the best part <laughs> so um, so the animals and there's bags so this is a bag building game um, and a tile placement game and it has some really awesome animal meeples like i just absolutely love these like these are just fantastic so this is the same publisher as wild serengeti so of course you are going to have these incredible animal meeples which are just really fantastic yeah so i mean there's a whole bunch there's like even like some kind of like a crocodile or something like that so yeah oh uh, this bird actually this bird is pretty let me show this bird and then there's a pink dolphin too the amazon dolphin i'll show that in a second that's a really pretty bird Doo -doo 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 -doo. um there's like a special expansion i got with some other cool anime pools i'll show those in a second it's a really cool pretty pink dolphin so yeah let me show you the other anime pools so yeah here are like some additional ones um, so it comes with a capybara. The capybara is so cute. It comes with whatever this is. It looks like some kind of a seal maybe. Or um, it comes with this. It looks like an anteater, I think. Um, yeah, 
and then some other cute like monkey thing in a bat and fish and a frog. Yeah, so those are some like additional meeples that I think came with like some special expansion or something. So this arrived. So of course this was like, you know, part of my um, fee for covering the game, like creating an overview video for that. So this arrived and I do want to play it again, but I think it's going to be a game that I have to play in my house because I am not about to take this anywhere or I have to pack the cardboard waterfall with me and then play it. Um, so a game that I purchased recently, which I almost forgot that I purchased because I should have shown it in the last video, <laughs> is Valbara. So I um, bought this with like some store credit I had and stuff. Um, so this is a published by Studio H Games and I like some of their other titles and so I thought I would check this out because it's had good reviews. It's an interesting box. It actually like just slides out like that. So it's not um, like a regular box. You just slide it out. Um, and then it's got some cards. So it's a game about the Vikings and Vikings are a theme that I actually like. So and um, I don't think I have too many Viking themed games. So at least I think it's about the Vikings. I'm pretty sure. Um, ba -dum -ba -dum -bum -bum. Look at these cards, they're so pretty. So yeah, I am looking forward to playing this at some point. Those scenes are just, sceneries are just so freaking pretty. And then, and then there's like just a bunch of cardboard components. Um, I'm guessing they're point tokens, but I really don't know. So yeah, so I bought this recently, so I'm looking forward to playing that at some point in time. Um, and then I will show you my Gen Con haul. So in the last video, I mentioned that a friend of mine was going to Gen Con and he offered to pick up some games for me and I was going to pay him for the games and shipping, but he very generously decided to gift me everything, which was extremely generous. Um, so, so thank you, Paul, again for these games. Um, so yeah, so he gifted these games to me, so I actually did not end up paying for them in the end. Um, so the first one I'll show is Bruxelles 1893. So this is a game that I have the old edition of and this new edition includes an expansion and updated artwork. So I am super excited to play this. Um, I absolutely love this game. I think it's a really fantastic game and I'm just super excited to have the new edition of it. I haven't unboxed it yet, but I can just show you some of the stuff. So like, doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, let's see. You yeah, know, there's a lot of cardboard that I need to... I'll show you the insert. The insert is nice. Um, so here is the insert and there's some boards here. And I'll show you so that, you know, there's room for tokens and all of that stuff there in the cardboard. So here, look at that. Is that upside down? No. It's just so pretty. So yeah, I'm really excited to play this new edition. Um, yeah, super excited for that. So thank you, Paul, for this game. Um, yeah, and there's like tokens and stuff and like, yeah, I'll show you the different tokens. Like, I don't remember what the colors were in the original game, so I can't comment on the differences. I can pull it out at some point and then do a comparison um, if people would like that, but I don't remember with the original old edition, um, the colors and stuff um, and then some cards, which I haven't yet taken out. So yeah, so that is Bruxelles. Um, the next game I will show that was part of my Gen Con haul. So I don't know if this will be widely available anytime soon. Um, I knew that it was going to be at Gen Con, so that's why I asked for this. Um, another game from my Gen Con haul is Tiger and Dragon. So I, you know, I went to the BGG page and looked up um, what games were going to be at Gen Con that publishers were trying to showcase and this was one of them and it just seemed really cool and it had a really good rating on BGG. It's interesting, these player boards um, were also the things that you just punched out certain tokens from but you don't discard these obviously because you're going to be using them throughout the game. Um, I guess maybe the tokens when you collect them you could maybe even just try to stick them back into the holes. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so yeah, it comes with a bunch of tiles with different numbers on them. At first glance you might not realize that they're numbers but they are are. like um, they're just very like stylized like um, like this is an eight um, here's like a three so at first glance I didn't even realize that they were numbers um, and then there's a dragon tile pretty cool they're pretty nice nice chunky tiles um, I don't know what this is but it has that and then all the tokens that were punched out of those boards that I showed 
Um, and then it has the game manual, of course. Um, so yeah, you can kind of, it's like a, um, so in this game, you are a Kung Fu master trading blows with the school of the tiger. Blue tiles in the school of the dragon. Red tiles defend against your opponent's attacks to turn the tables and launch an attack of your own. So this game is based on the popular and traditional Japanese game Goita. Play your hand and try to be the first to win the round. Defend against your opponent's attack tile by placing the same tile yourself to turn the tables and launch into your own attack. If you are the first to finish playing all your tiles, you receive a certain amount of score chips depending on the tile that you won with. Uh, keep playing until a player collects 10 score chips. They win the game. Okay, so yeah, so I suppose when you win a score chip, you can just kind of like slot it back into the board in which you punch them out from. So yeah, so that is just the rule book. And it has rule books in a couple of different languages. And then it has these battle cards. Um, so I guess there's different kinds of battles you can play. Like for example, there's like a bamboo forest battle. So I guess, you know, there's different battles you can play and different objectives maybe that you can try to meet. This game is actually for two to five players um, and the, it's designed by Atsushi Hashimoto and it's published by Arclight Games. Um, yeah, so that is Tiger and Dragon. Now the next game is a game that I'm super duper excited about. Um, you will see why in a minute. <laughs> So um, I absolutely love Halloween. So I had heard a lot about this two player game, um, but I never played it. Um, and then when I found out that there was going to be a Halloween edition of it, I decided I absolutely need it. So Boop was like very close to the top of my Gen, Call, Gen Con wish list. So my friend was able to pick me up a copy of Boop. So it's extra long. So the original Boop just has two O's in it, but this one has four O's in it. So this is the Halloween edition. So in this game, it's a two player game. You are actually going to turn the board over and then place this on it. So you're going to be playing on this like cloth. So it's like your cats pushing other cats off of the bed. Um, so yeah. So let me just show you these amazing cat meeples. I absolutely love them. So you are going to have like little kitten cats and then adult cats. So you're going to have like these little kittens and you're trying to turn your kittens into adults. And then you're trying to make your adults uh, line up in order to win this game. But with this new addition, you also have a ghost cat as well. And the ghost cat, I believe, has special abilities that the cats in the original game don't. So the black ones are really cool. They've got the purple hats. The white ones, they are with pumpkins and they are super adorable as well. I mean, look at the kittens and the cats in the of the white color. Super adorable. And their ghost is a light orange. So yeah, I absolutely love this because I am a huge Halloween fan. In fact, I've just, I already started using all my Halloween stuff. So this is a Hocus Pocus uh, Corksicle uh, tumbler. Um, I had to order that online because that was a special edition that Disney World had like a couple years ago. And uh, Corksicle makes really good like um, cups that insulate your drinks and keep them cold for a certain number of hours or keep them more hot for a certain number of hours. And I really wanted a Halloween themed Corksicle cup and so I googled it and I came across this one that was at Disney World a couple of years ago and I'm actually a huge Hocus Pocus fan so I was like that's perfect like I watch Hocus Pocus every single Halloween it's like a Halloween tradition of mine so yeah so I absolutely love this boop edition and I cannot wait to play it like I said I don't have the original boop and I'm glad I don't because now I'm like I don't even need it like I have this Halloween edition and I don't care if it's like May I will still be playing with my Halloween edition because I absolutely love Halloween and I've already started decorating my house for Halloween. In fact, I'm wearing jack-o'-lantern e earrings today. So yeah, I am definitely already in the Halloween spirit. I feel like once August rolls around, I'm like, it's basically Halloween. Like it's already autumn, so it's Halloween time now. So yeah, so super excited to play this. Um, so thank you, Paul, for these amazing games. So very kind of you. So let's move on to updates. Um, so as I mentioned in the intro of this video, we are coming up on 100 soon. So I want to try to do like a big giveaway for that. Um, but I didn't get too many suggestions in my last video about what to do about raising funds for the cats. But despite that, I got a few donations. So I received enough donations to buy two more cat shelters. So I already purchased one and then I received donations to purchase two more cat shelters and these shelters house multiple cats. I'm waiting until the first one arrives and I'm going to 
to assemble that and put it in the area where all the cats are it's going to be very difficult feeding them in the winter time like if you guys could see this area i just don't even know how i'm going to manage in the winter but i guess i'll figure that out once winter arrives um, but i have to find a good spot for these shelters and um, hopefully put them in an area where the cats won't like get covered with snow and we'll still be able to walk to the get to the area where I'll be giving them food like I'm gonna have a lot to figure out like I just don't even know how this is going to work in the winter but I you know thank you so much to my viewers who did donate money for the shelters I really appreciate it um, so previously I mentioned mentioned Richard donated so thank you Richard and he was the one who donated to allow me to purchase the first shelter and then Michael and Tim also donated so thank you to them um, thank you so much um, I'm sure the cats will really appreciate your donations. And then of course there's an ongoing expense of food. So, you know, um, I don't know how many shelters will need, but um, you know, if you, I, I will happily take donations anytime, any amount that anyone is able to give because food is expensive uh, when you're feeding that many cats. But thank you so much to everyone who did donate. So maybe for, um, so, you know, I had previously mentioned in the last video that maybe I'll try to get like game donations and try to do a live stream and give away those games in order to try to raise funds. It didn't seem like anyone was down with that idea. Like no one responded saying that they would actually watch a live stream <laughs> fundraiser. So I guess I won't do that because um, it would be, make no sense to do a live stream fundraiser if no one's actually going to watch and donate anything. Um, but, you know, again, I'll ask again just in case you know, someone didn't watch the last video and they might be interested, um, you know, but I would need a significant amount of people to watch and kind of participate, I think, in order to raise funds for the cats that way. Um, so again, if you have any ideas, I would really appreciate it. Um, maybe I can somehow tie it into my 100th video celebration, because as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, I am coming up on 100 videos soon. I mean, like we're like 20 some videos away now. So, you know, OK, maybe not that soon. So I guess that's still a couple of months away. Um, but, you know, um, if there's some way to you know, merge those two together, like fundraising and celebration and giveaway, whatever. I don't know. Um, you know, you guys are creative. If you can think of something, let me know. I don't think that there's any other updates. Oh, FlagCon. I will mention FlagCon. So we've already sold around 75 tickets for FlagCon. So that's great. Um, so again, FlagCon, the Finger Lakes Area Gaming Convention is the first weekend of November from Friday to Sunday. And I can look up the exact dates, uh, the first weekend. So that is Friday, November 3rd to Sunday, November 5th. So FlagCon will be taking place in Ithaca, New York at Hotel Ithaca. Ithaca is amazing. It's gorgeous. So definitely do come check us out. Um, you will. There will be events. So I'm actually hosting a couple events. So I've already signed up to host a game of Three Ring Circus, Moon, and Petrichor. And I'll probably sign up for some more, but I also have to do volunteer shifts. But, you know, this is not a convention with only events. Like there will be tables for open gaming and we're going to have a game library. So, you know, um, please, you know, if you live nearby, or have always wanted to visit Ithaca, now is the perfect time because it will be autumn and Ithaca in autumn is really beautiful. It's just a, such a wonderful place. Um, so highly recommend and there's just a lot to see and do in Ithaca as well. Um, so yeah, Cornell University is located in Ithaca and if you visit the Cornell campus, you will have amazing views of Ithaca, including the Cayuga Lake and uh, sunset. It's just absolutely beautiful. So I myself love to take walks around campus on Cornell and just appreciate the sunsets and stuff. It's just really, really beautiful. Highly recommend it. So if you can make it out to FlagCon, that would be fantastic. Um, so I'll leave a link down below again. Um, tickets are going to be the lowest prices until the end of this month, and then the price will increase by a little bit. So yes, yeah, so if you want to book your tickets, now is the time to do it. So moving on, I don't think I have any other updates. Um, -bum 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 -bum, let me see. So yeah, moving on. I, I don't think I have any other updates. So let's just go to questions and commentary. So since I showed you guys Boop and I'm already in the Halloween spirit, I wanted to know what are your favorite Halloween or holiday editions of board games? Like I think the main holidays that would probably be um, depicted in board games are like 
uh, Halloween and Christmas, and then maybe to a lesser extent Valentine's Day. I don't think that there's going to be many other holidays that really show up in board games. Um, but yeah, what are your favorite Halloween themed games? Um, and by that, I mean like specifically Halloween, not just like spooky in general, but like actually Halloween themed. Um, I think I can think of only a few. So I have Halloween patchwork and then, okay, maybe this isn't necessarily Halloween themed. So I'm probably going against my own question, but it could be, um, dead and breakfast. I think that's pretty like on, like, like very focused on, you know, spooky and Halloween. Um, so, but yeah, cause there's like ghosts in the windows and witches and stuff like that. So I think dead and breakfast could probably count as a Halloween game. Um, but yeah, let me know what your favorite Halloween themed games are. And if you're not into Halloween, then Christmas, because I, all, I really do like Christmas and Christmas themed games as well. And before we know it, Halloween and Christmas will be here. So let me know. And hopefully by the next video, I will have played Boop and can give you guys a review of that. So until next time, bye. Thank you.